Well, this morning we continue in our series on 1 Peter, and maybe I'm talking too much about suffering. I see maybe more people are away this weekend, or maybe suffering is an unpleasant topic for us to talk about. I'm joking, but for me it's been very rich for us to continue in this book of 1 Peter. And although not a long book of the Bible, I think sometimes when we study that together, when in different fellowship groups we're discussing it, our ability to go deeply into God's word and message can be very rich for us. And so we are, in fact, on part eight. Uh, we just have part nine and ten to go, and, and then we'll have literally looked at and read every single verse of this small book of First Peter. Well, where did I end off uh, last week? We looked at the cross, and we see this uh, handsome model selling this little cross necklace, and we realized the cross can have many, many different meanings, a lot of beautiful meanings, that God is with us, and when people cross themselves, they often do it whenever the service says the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reminded of a triune God, reminded that God resurrected, the cross is empty. But last week, I reminded us, we cannot forget the cross also means suffering. And suffering is a major theme in the book of First Peter. And last week, we thought, oh, suffering. I would much rather have blessing than suffering. And we might, in fact, think of them as opposites. But that's also where we ended uh, last week, was to not think about them as opposites. But sometimes, in something like Jesus' cross, the two that seem like opposites actually come together. Let me remind you of this quote. Peter has moved to the issue that is central for the rest of the letter. And for us, we're coming into the end of the letter. The issue of Christian suffering. He has shown how the love of God turns the problem upside down. Christians are free from the need of vindication and filled with humility as heirs of grace. Suffering has become an opportunity to meet evil with good and cursing with blessing. Christians should therefore not think it strange that they are called to endure persecution. Oh, I would also add the word suffering. Yet they must understand that suffering is not the opposite of blessing. Well, this morning, uh, as I mentioned to the kids, it is rainy, it is dark, <laughs> and we're talking about suffering. That's like a triple whammy, but I hope uh, as we go into God's Word, uh, it'll be rich uh, for us together. And to, again, think about what does the cross mean for us today. And so I've entitled today's sermon for part eight, Suffering. How, for what, and for whom? Suffering, question mark. How, for what, and for whom? Well, let's recap where we are in the book of 1 Peter, and uh, I've shown you this slide before, but I actually just want to highlight the bottom uh, here when I listed the different themes, oops, uh, just here. So it's a short book, 17-minute reading time, written to Jewish and Gentile believers, written to Christians spread out, actually over a large area, and the situation is, their things are difficult, but rem be reminded of the themes which I showed you when we began this uh, more than 10 weeks ago. The themes include Christian identity suffering, Jesus' example in suffering and sacrifice, and future hope of Christ's resurrection. And so there's been a difficulty as we think about being chosen exiles, but we know we're not chosen exiles without hope. We're actually chosen exiles who have a Lord and Savior who gives us living hope. So let's see what we can learn about suffering together. First, our suffering, it mirrors Christ's suffering. Suffering has this way of making us feel incredibly lonely, does it not? Because our particular suffering, we can feel like no one else in the world feels or understands what I do. Why am I the one given the kind of suffering I'm given to? But a Christian view of suffering is actually very different, is that our suffering is not alone. It is with the communal body of Christ, but shares in the suffering of Christ. Let's look at the beginning of our passage as we think, and we're going to be narrow into the cross as we go. And I'm just going to focus on the first few words of our passage, okay? Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. If the man we follow, the man who is our Lord and Savior, suffered, then Peter wants to remind us that we ought to be thinking and prepared in the same way. Arm yourselves, prepare yourselves with the same way of thinking. And why did Jesus suffer? There was a couple of things. He entered a broken world. So part of our suffering is just an admission that the world is, in fact, broken. 
We do not need to be a Buddhist in this, thinking, oh, we can escape suffering. No, Christians think about the world very, very differently. That to enter into a broken world means there is suffering. But Jesus didn't suffer just because of that, but Jesus also suffered because he lived the right way. He sought and followed God completely, so he was a light in a world of darkness and faced suffering for that as well. And so for Jesus, there's a double whammy, entering a broken world, but also living as a light in a world of darkness. And so Peter, and we're going to see this to the close of the book, really wants us to know and embrace and understand suffering as part of the Christian call. So my question for you is, what is your attitude and expectation towards suffering? When suffering comes, well, comes for all of us, and even as we come this morning, I'm sure in the background, in our hearts and minds, there are different kinds of suffering. What is our attitude and expectation with suffering? It makes all the difference what our attitude and expectation is. And that's why I think Peter wants to teach us about suffering. It's a no-brainer that we face suffering, but our attitude and expectation makes a very, very big difference. I want to read a quote to you uh, from uh, a Christian, Scott Peck. And he writes us about suffering and difficulty. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. Because once it is accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. I've stared at this quote uh, many, many times (laughs) <laughs> and one of the books I'm reading on discipleship, and actually for a young adult fellowship, is uh, discussing discipleship, quotes this book. And I've thought about what it means to truly embrace that our world has suffering and a difference that makes. I want to share two small examples, and they both come from a tired uh, young father, okay? One is putting on coats, and one is sleep. Now, it is winter, and that means every time we leave the house, we need to put the coat on baby forest. Now, baby Forrest lately does not like his coat, okay? Now, the reality is he needs to put on the coat. And I'm using the putting on the coat as an analogy for suffering. It's not that much suffering. But for Forrest, it's considered a lot of suffering. Now, Forrest's attitude and expectation of the coat completely changes how the next 10 minutes are going to look. So with Forrest, we often say Mandarin too far, which means we're going we're to go out. And Forrest is always excited to go out. He raises his hand and says, too far. And then he sees the coat. And one of two things can happen. One, he can embrace the coat and say, well, I want to go out of the house. I must put on a coat and then go. Uh, He used to be able to do that. Lately, not so much. The moment he sees the coat, he runs away. And for Poch and I, this means the next 10 minutes is filled with quite a bit of suffering and difficulty. I wonder if that can give us a little bit of insight into this, that the difficulty for Forrest is the expectation and attitudes towards a reality he has to face. Now, that's from a baby's perspective. I don't blame Forrest for what he's going through. Let's look from an adult's point of view, and my second example is that of sleep. Now, before I was a father, everyone joked, enjoy your sleep now. And it's true. Uh, Also lately, Forrest has decided to wake up at midnight, maybe 3 a.m., maybe 5 a.m., and then sleep again at 7 a.m., And so Poch and I have been losing a lot of sleep. And as a parent, this is a form of suffering that all parents face. And my attitude and expectation makes all the difference. And I wish I had a good attitude and a good expectation. Most days I don't. But there are some days where I remember, oh, right, this is part of the suffering of being a parent. And on those days, when Forrest does wake up mysterious in the middle of the night, I go to him, and instead of it having triple the weight of suffering, which is, oh, this again, Oh, I'm disappointed. Oh, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is every other toddler probably sleeping right now except for mine? That attitude towards suffering, as you can imagine, actually multiplies the difficulty of what I'm about to face. So I think when Scott Peck talks about Christians facing suffering and difficulty, he's not saying there's no burden at all, that it's not difficult, but I think he's saying something about the attitude and expectation when we face suffering, and that actually the vast majority of it is our attitude. Now, as we get into suffering, I don't want to make light of suffering. I don't know if we we would need many hours to sit in a big circle to understand all the suffering we face in this room. And in fact, if we look at the example of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he struggled greatly 
to embrace his particular suffering, which was an incredible, terrible, shameful type of suffering to go to the cross. So I don't mean to make light of it, but the first point we need to see that Peter wants us to understand is that our suffering mirrors Christ's suffering. And so as we think about suffering, we need to be thinking, oh, how did Jesus do this? And didn't Jesus come to the world with eyes open, knowing this is why I'm here? This is why I'm here. And so if force wakes me up tonight, I have to know as a parent, this is why I'm here. <laughs> this is why I'm here, in fact. Second point, our suffering leads to God's new life. Leads to God's new life. And if we desire God's new life uh, as, as a logical uh, conclusion, we do go through suffering and death, actually, as Christians. Let's look at what it says here. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. What is that saying there? When we enter into our Christian faith, we actually put something to death so we can live a new way. Adiji Bonhoeffer would put this uh, quite strongly when he says, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. That for all the people Jesus called to follow him, they actually had to figuratively put to death their old way of living and thinking in order to take on the new life of God. That is the mystery of Christianity, is that in fact, we die to live again. This will remind us of many of Jesus' words. Uh, from one of them, I'll say from Matthew 12, when Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls on the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, what Jesus is doing here is playing with this idea of life and death, that if we actually desire the new life of Jesus, the path is through suffering and death. Okay? So again, for Christians, when we think about what is our attitude and expectation, this is sort of a necessary thing. This is the chemotherapy approach God needs to do to destroy our selfishness and sin so that he can birth a new life inside of us. And that is not particularly comfortable. Okay? And so Peter wants to say, when you have suffered in the flesh, when God starts to convict you of your sin, and you start to hate it, you despise it, and you want to follow Jesus, well, Jesus is actually calling us to live for the rest of our lives, no longer for human passions and sinful things, but for the will of God. And he's going to go and make a list of just things that other people, for the listeners at the time, would realize, oh, everyone else in the world lives for these sinful, selfish things, okay? For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles, or Gentiles can also mean the other nations, non, the people who aren't God's people want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. If you understand a little bit about Greco-Roman world, you realize none of those words are exaggerations. Those are the things that were happening in their society, and people loved to indulge in. Okay? But here's where it means to suffer, to live differently in this world is difficult. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So some of the uh, Roman and Greek gods actually had incredible sexual uh, promiscuity with temple prostitutes and stuff like that. So if you are someone who indulged in that, you thought, oh, the way to live my life is sexual pleasure. There's no idea of faithfulness. There's no idea of one partner, and I enjoy that type of life. After you choose to follow Jesus, what Peter is saying, people are going to be surprised that you don't join them anymore. Oh, we used to invite you. We used to go to these parties of drinking or wild sexuality, and suddenly you don't want to go anymore. Why not? There must be something wrong with you. And so actually, Peter says, they will malign you. The world that does not understand why you would choose to live for Jesus will not understand you and will, in fact, be fearful of you. And often this happens uh, with unjust treatment or persecution. And the Roman Empire did not understand Christians, and that was a source of part of the persecution and misunderstanding. So Peter gives us a heads up. They malign you. 
But he gives us hope and says, but they will give account to him. So perhaps during our earthly time, Christians will face all types of unjust suffering. But Peter says the day will come when they actually will need to stand before who? Not Emperor Nero, not the local governor, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords himself. So we face unjust suffering, and we looked at examples of this, whether with the government, between masters and slaves, between husbands and wives, all sorts of different relationships. Peter says, when you face suffering, remember there is only one King of Kings and only one Lord of Lords. And one day we all stand before that one King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that is the hope of vindication. And why in the quote before did it say Christians do not need to seek their own vindication? is because we have a Lord and Savior who ultimately will judge the living and the dead. Let's continue on slide two of our passage. For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Well, this is a very, very puzzling verse, and a a lot of biblical scholars still struggle to say, what does it mean to preach to those who are dead? And 1 Peter has a couple of these puzzling uh, verses. I would suggest to you what, this, uh, what Peter is doing is paralleling death and life. And he's saying, just as Romans says, the wages of sin is death. Then actually for all of us, all of our mortal flesh faces in a way the judgment of sin, which is our physical bodies will die. But for those who follow the good news of Jesus, There is a purpose for the suffering. So when I mention this main point is our suffering leads to God's new life. You see that in the second half of this passage. Yes, judge in the flesh the way people are. That is uh, one of the outcomes of sin in our world is death exists in our world. The terrible, terrible consequence of death. But if we go through suffering as Christ did, we may live in the spirit the way God does. So when we think about our suffering leading uh, to new life, then we think of the example of Jesus. As he went through suffering and death, he was given new life. Then Peter says, the same for us, the same for us. We might live in the new life of the Spirit with the living hope. And so, brothers and sisters, when we face our suffering, we have to remember that suffering actually is a vehicle through which we receive God's new life. The third thing I want to say about suffering from our passage is our suffering gives glory to Jesus. This morning we sang, crown him with many crowns, and I challenge to think, when we come on Sunday mornings, are we ready to bring our gift, our worship, all that we are, and lay it at the feet of Jesus? Remove our crowns and lay them at the feet of Jesus. Well, the other thing mysteriously our suffering does, it gives glory to Jesus. And all of this redemptive side of suffering is going to help us because suffering, again, can feel pointless and tragic and just the most useless thing we can imagine, the most undesirable thing we can imagine. Let's see how our passage talks about this. The end of all things is at hand. Uh, Peter wonders, when will Jesus come again? And we need to be thinking, actually, with the end in mind, even though it's been more than 2,000 years. But let's see how he says to do this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. He's saying because of that, as you face different kinds of suffering, have a clear mind about things. Be sensible about how you're going to live your life because you know something that no one else knows, that there is a Lord of Lords and a King of Kings, Jesus Christ, and through death and suffering is new life. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And then he goes on to say how we can serve one another. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Then he gives a few examples of how to do that. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Now, we've done, uh, each year we've been talking about this idea of stewardship, so this is a word you should be familiar with now, but thinking about what God has given you and how you may use it. And Peter is very clear to use, say, varied grace. There's variation. And so for each one of us in this room, God has given us different kinds of his grace and gift. 
And that's something beautiful about the body of Christ is we need each other. We don't do this alone. But Peter says, with the end in mind, and even when we face suffering, remember to serve each other, to love one another, to share hospitality with one another without grumbling. Well, your wonder might be wondering, what does that have to do with suffering? I thought this whole end of this book is about suffering. Well, I think suffering is actually another way of just describing what it means to give of yourself to one another. So if Jesus is suffering on the cross, you can imagine it's his offering. He pours out his life. His body is broken for us. His blood is shed for us. Then all these small instructions and commandments about loving, hospitality, serving one another, we can see in the same way. If suffering is a pouring out of ourselves, then Peter's saying, pour out yourself to one another. Give of yourself to one another, just as Jesus gave to us. So as Jesus suffered and poured out himself, so our connection is to do that as well. And here, then, although this almost sounds like the end of the book, it's not. But often you'll see in the New Testament, the author just breaks out in a sense of praise. And it can feel like the ending of a, a, a book or a doxology. And he says, in order, so all the suffering we face, that we will continue to love, do what is right, and serve one another. Why? In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The suffering we carry may be undesirable. We may feel so lonely in it. But the picture here actually is that one day it's part of the crown we lay and we say, Jesus, I walked my path. The mission you called me to, the cross you called me to bear, I now lay it at your feet. Because we have to remember when Jesus entered into heaven, All glory was given to him. Why? Because he suffered and died. Glory be to the lamb who was slain. And so again, our suffering mirrors Christ's suffering. And we don't do anything as on the scale of what Jesus did. But each one of us does have a cross to carry, a suffering to bear. And we may feel burdened down by that cross. But one day, the day will come where God the Father lifts us up from our suffering even through death as we pass on to the next life. And so for Christ the King Sunday, we remember all glory and dominion belongs to Jesus. And so for Christians at this time, whether they faced Emperor Nero, they faced an unjust master, an unjust uh, head of the household, they could know, in a way, I am serving Lord Jesus. And it reminds me of Uh, Let me just read the verse from Colossians 3, which I've read to you before. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And this is reiterating what we've been talking about here. Peter's saying, as you do these things, as you pour out yourself, you are doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that transformed the Roman Empire. Well, let's think about as we go into closing. It's the same verse I shared with you last week. From earlier in our book, 1 Peter 2, gives us a hint of where the rest of the book was going. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. The The mystery of the Christian faith is as Jesus walked out his life, being born, being baptized, receiving his calling, being filled with the Holy Spirit, suffering and dying, our path is the same. And we share mystically in the life of Jesus. This is what it means to be in Christ. So we have been called, if Jesus is the, the chosen exile, and we'll go back to why we named the series Chosen Exiles Living Hope. You remember, Jesus is the ultimate chosen exile, capital C, capital E. And we are many chosen exiles, following in a path together, arm in arm, Christians, following in the same path of Jesus, knowing just as Jesus was vindicated, so we shall as well. So what has our passage taught us about these four questions again? Suffering, question mark? Yes. We don't desire it, but it is part of the reality. And the sooner as Christians you truly grasp and understand it, Ironically, it saves you a lot of suffering. 
like Forrest putting on his coat. If we can understand our example of Jesus Christ, our suffering Savior, then we can say, suffering, yes, check off that box. But that's not the end of the story. How? How? Well, this passage reminds us to do this with the end in mind, to know that suffering will lead us to new life and will bring glory to God. That's going to help us do all of that. For what? What do we suffer for? Well, we suffer because it is, in fact, a broken world we are in. But in suffering, we learn to die to our sins. And so whatever sins and temptations you are facing today, do you know and can you actually say with happiness, God is calling me to die to that. I am killing those sins and addictions in my life. Why? Because new life can grow then. I'm like a garden. And as God kills weeds, beautiful, beautiful things can grow in our lives. That is the for what. And lastly, for whom? And so if Christians at the time faced unjust emperors and governors, unjust masters and slaves, unjust and broken husbands and wives and relationships, the point that allowed the Christians to face all those kinds of sufferings is because they knew the suffering was their way to serve Jesus alone. So brothers and sisters, on this dark, cold, rainy morning, what is your attitude and expectation with the suffering you are facing right now? What is your attitude and expectation with the suffering you are facing right now or the new suffering that might come tomorrow? We have a hope. We do not carry this cross forever, but during this time, it is our mission and calling as chosen exiles, but we know we follow Christ who is king. He alone can lift us up, so we're not overburdened by this cross, but we can live a life, his life, with peace, knowing that God turns suffering into the most beautiful of things, and you and I are here because of the cross. I want to read you a collect. We prayed this at Synod this past week, actually, and it struck me as I've been thinking about uh, this passage all week. It's known as the colic for endurance. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and enter not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. Now, I'm, when I read this prayer, it just, just hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah, we follow a Lord and Savior who did go to joy, but not first, who did enter glory, but not first, but in fact faced suffering and crucifixion. And so we need Jesus to guide us so we are not lost in despair or hopelessness, but we can find the way of life and peace. You know, with the children, I reminded them, oh, the life of Jesus, we remember that he suffered, he died, and he rose. That's the path. Jesus walked, and it's the path you and I are called to follow. And today in our Holy Communion liturgy, we recite exactly this. Okay? Let's look at later on when we come to the slide. Later on, all of us, as we come to Holy Communion, remember that Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's Christ's footsteps. We'll remind each other we are brothers and sisters through his blood, and then we also remind ourselves we will walk the same footsteps. And through suffering, we have died together, we will rise together, and we will live together. Brothers and sisters, as we close, I want to invite us to stand. And the act of standing is to ready ourselves. It's to arm ourselves with the same thinking of Christ. And I'm going to invite us to look at the cross and to remember the path Christ has walked. He has died, he has risen, he will come again. And after a moment of quiet reflection on the cross, we together will pray this collect for endurance and ask again that we will set our eyes on the Savior who went not to joy first, went not to glory first, but walked his path, and God the Father granted him the joy and glory afterwards. Let's take a moment of quiet as we reflect on the cross of Christ.
And as we prepare to pray at the end, I will cross myself. And I do encourage you, for some of you, find a, a physical motion very helpful. To be reminded of the cross that covers us, the cross that redeems us, and yet also our cross to carry and follow. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, now let's try again together. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and enter not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord.